I got her on. I got her on there now. And I think everything is on. Okay. Well, um, welcome to our first Live Tech Tuesday. This is uh, the subject of this one is universal design for learning, specifically technology tools that we've got for universal design for learning uh, in the classroom. And uh, many of the things that I'm going to talk about are things that have been uh, uh, things I've looked into in the past. Didn't look at them as UDL principles at the time, but because of uh, Luke's delay in reading and Luke's delay um, because of his physical disability with the ability to write and manipulate stuff with his hands, he doesn't have a delay cognitively, but at the same time he does um, when it comes to reading. So there's been some things that, that have come to mind uh, that I felt like I, I should be looking into. Let's see if I can get this to go next. And I'm not. Why am I not? Am I frozen? Hmm. For some reason I'm frozen. I do like the lower square. I like that idea. Why? No. No. There we go. Okay. So hopefully the hopefully we'll work from here on out. So um, I did a little research, and and this is just some stuff on the the basic ideas of UDL. Uh, there's three principles, three primary ideas of UDL, and we're going to be really looking at this one today. And that is uh, the recognition network and ways that we can represent what we teach so that students can access it more readily and, and a larger division of students can access uh, the information. And it is not going to, it's not going to go forward for me. Okay. One of the things I looked into is that, is what's the difference between UDL and differentiation? Because we've all learned about differentiation before and we've all talked about differentiation. And differentiation is about what I can do to reach that student right there. And it talks about modifying my instruction to get to him because he's got something specifically that's on an IEP that I've been given by the school counselor that says you need to differentiate for that kid because of this. And not that we don't differentiate in general, but we use formative data to figure out ways that we can get to our kids that aren't getting them. The idea of UDL is that we change the framework of what we're teaching in a way that all of our kids, or it represents a wider spectrum of our lear kids' learning. Uh, and one of the things that I think we watched last year was that, or we were assigned to watch, was that Teaching to the Edges video which was a TEDx video that talked about the idea is don't teach it to the average student, try to find a way to teach to the edge students and all the students uh, benefit from that. So that's really what UDL is talking about is not modifying for a student, it's modifying your curriculum ahead of time for all the students and this is a big huge uh, verbiage on the difference between UDL and differentiated in instruction but really um, if you use UDL you are effectively differentiating your instruction for everyone at the same time, and then you might still have to do differentiation, but if you design really well in the first place, then you're gonna have to do less and less differentiation because you're already hitting the spectrum of, of all your students and not teaching just the average student in the first place. So, when it comes to technology and hitting those multiple means of representation, that's what this class is about, and, and what we already have access to that we can do here at Trail without a huge change of philosophy, a huge change, but maybe modifying some of the things that we do right now so that we can make our classroom more, I don't know if the word UDL compliant is a good way of saying it, but more UDL um, structured is probably the, the best way to say it. So we have technologies that can support teachers by providing those multiple means of representation, and we already have tons of existing tools in place here at National Trail to do that. And, and of those, the biggest one is the fact that we're one-to-one. -one. The fact that we're one-to-one -one allows us to do things that other schools can't do. At where my son is, they can do many of these things, but it's just for him, because he's the only kid in the classroom who has an iPad, so that's it. It's not UDL, it's just you can do that, whereas we can do it, so it, it is UDL, so it's hitting everyone because of the one-to-one. -one. And we're one-to-one -one in all classes, first grade through 12th grade now, right? So everyone's got a projector, everyone's got an interactive whiteboard, everyone that asks for one's got a microphone, and anybody that asks for one will get a microphone. Um, everyone either has a document camera or can have a document camera. I've got, you know, if we're sitting all over on the shelf, all somebody has to do is ask, and what I'm reporting on right there is a document camera as well. And everyone has access to scanners in the, 
in the offices, plus I've got a whole bunch on the shelves. I will be honest, people have turned back in those classroom scanners because it's a pain in the butt to do uh, 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 as opposed to just sticking your stack in there and go boop, and it's all scanned, right? The same way we scanned all the books and stuff that we did when we did the one-to-one. -one. So, of the things that I wanted to talk about, the first one is recording our classes and doing just like this, okay? Recording and posting classroom lessons are currently something that makes our teaching accessible to kids all the time, particularly if they're distracted, overwhelmed, in particular ADHD and ADD kids that can't, um, don't have the attention span to stay concentrating for however long we go. We all have a tendency to go over that 20 minutes of lecture. I do too because I got, I got 80 minutes tomorrow that we're going to break down and put together computers so I can't teach a little tomorrow and teach a little today and do half of that today because then I have computers all over the table. Expression, well, any lab teachers in that, right? When you're going to do a lab, you want the whole class period to do the lab, so you have to use the preceding whole class period to get the instruction in for the lab. But they don't have that attention span. I have great students, and in, in uh, my last lecture, I had one that I won't say her name, but she was trying as hard as she could to concentrate. I saw her eyes rolling back in her head and doing this stuff, and I, I'm like, I'm like, okay, everybody, well, let's take a break, let's stand up, you know, kind of thing, because as much as she wanted to be there. She wasn't, and I knew she wasn't from looking at her. And I was the same way. When I was in calculus, I remember uh, Mr. Grant would be talking, and all of a sudden, I come back to Indiana, and I don't. I was in Hawaii. I was swimming. I don't know what I was doing. It was usually beach related, but I, I missed ten minutes. I missed a whole calculus problem, and I have absolutely no idea what that problem was or what he did. So if we record and make those lessons available, it's not about. Uh, just the kid who missed school, but it's the kid who didn't understand what you said the first time, who wasn't paying attention, who was overwhelmed with something at home, or distracted because it, somebody's in the hospital, somebody went off the road and you know did a 180 off the side of the road today, how well is he concentrating in his classes today? It's probably still all from the fact that he almost flipped over in a cornfield. So how hard is this? It's not hard, it's I hit record, and I hit stop, I upload it to YouTube and I post it on my, on my class, right? So this is something to me that's really UDL compliant for everybody because I have the smallest number of class of kids we know in, at the high school, but I have 300,000 views in my videos and it's not because I assigned them. It's because in that 80 minute flock, they missed something and they watched it for three minutes and that's all it's about. It's about the, the five minutes they missed other than the kid who missed class, right? That's I want them to watch the whole class, the student that wasn't here for the introduction and we went over the syllabus, they're getting the whole thing. But it's for that kid who can't stay there and every kid can't stay there and there's no way to know when they phased out or they phased out or they phased out in my classroom, all of them had the ability to get the instruction again. And for those kids that can't read but can comprehend, maybe you gave them this worksheet and maybe you gave them this reading and maybe you gave them that lecture too and it all went over the same thing but the only one of those three that's viable for that kid who's reading in the third grade reading level is that lecture when you went over it once but instead of doing the reading I just go watch the video again it's particularly when it's 15 through 25 that's the most important thing you need to get from that that class and it's no extra work for you it's just recording right so I'm not going to go over how to, how to record and how to post videos. We've done that a bunch of times. I, I made another really small recording on how to, uh, how to set up your recorder if you need to. And by the way, this tiny URL down at the bottom, the dogoo.gl slash whatever, is this presentation that you can go to and you can click on that link or you can type it in, whichever one. So how to record is three minutes long. And if you've done it ever before with Smart Recorder, you only have to set it up once. And how to post is four minutes long, and it's how, and this is how to how do you upload to YouTube, and how do you get it in in your calendar? Account, okay, so every single class I do is just a link on the calendar, which I think is I used to post them on YouTube and make playlists, and the kids have to used to have to try to find that day. This way is way better, you know. If they if they uh, I think I've got well, my links aren't working anyway. So let's see. Nope, nope. Where's that? Let's see if this one worked. No, that one didn't work either. 
Okay. Well, we'll assume you know, that you understand calendar. if you click on there. Calendar sounds better. I've never looked yeah. at the calendar. If you click right on the calendar, I mean, it's the same thing as embedding YouTube anywhere else. You yeah. just make an event that day. I paste it on there. If they go there, go straight to that lesson and they watch the lesson. And uh, you don't even have to name them because when you when you you know when you save them, it says the date and the time. You name them when you put them on Moodle, anyways. I put PC Breakdown Day One, and then the name of the video shows up on the video itself. But so a lot of us are wasting our Moodle page with titles and things day by day by day instead of doing this. Yeah, I think it's way easier. It does, right? Because it's just calendar. on the calendar, and they can see, oh, it was on the fifteenth, and it says right there what we did on the fifteenth. So I think it's easier for my kids to find my stuff. Right, and I've never saw it that way. the amount of work that it took is less than it takes between periods. I can have it uploaded, linked, and walk out, walk over to the door before the three minutes is up. You can. I can. Right, but I mean, but my point is that I'll get there. it's not. It doesn't. It's not a. Uh, I got. It. It's going to be twenty minutes. As soon as you do it every day for a week, it's like it's nothing. It okay. Happen. So those are there. I didn't want to go over it again because we've gone over that and and. Really, if I go over it, you're going to go, how did he do that? It would be better just to watch the three-minute video uh, when you go there. Okay, so that's the first thing is giving your students access to your instruction anytime they need it. All right? The next one is making your content available to all levels of reading. And, and one of the videos I watched, in fact, let's watch the video. We're gonna, th this one, yeah, we're just going to watch for a minute. We'll see if it plays. Oh, sound on my Assume that every kid is reading at grade level. This kid's in trouble. Because for her, science class is first and foremost a reading test. And it's doubtful that we will ever see what she's truly capable of. Now, it's one thing when our technology does not allow us to do anything other than average. But it is a whole other thing when the technology changes, and we can do more, but we don't realize it. That's where we are today. Okay, this the is, last the, this is the, the video I was talking about if you wanted to watch the whole thing. All right. um, but, but that's what he's talking about, is the fact that we have the ability to make it so kids, I don't want to say don't have to read, but the kids that are struggling readers, like my son, that has the ability to understand the content just fine, it's just, you know, he's got three black spots in his brain, and one of them, two of them are physical, and one of them does that reading spot, and if I tell him something, he will not forget it. Yeah. But it, but his ability to read and put the, those letters together is bogglingly difficult. He gets so exhausted, exhausted from, from two sentences, and it, it looks like his eyes are gonna roll back, and, say, and he can read those two sentences, but then he just looks like I just, I just made him swim a mile. And so what other ways can we do that? So we've got Chrome apps available to us that open doors to all that digital content. So every student can have it read to them and watch it as they read, and it's really easy and it's completely free. The only requirement for us is to make sure our content is digital in the first place. So I'm gonna show you those. The first one is called Read and Write Google Chrome, um, and this one is awesome. Uh, the reason I like this one, I'm gonna show you it being used, is that I like this one because it has a really nice uh, ability, a slider bar to make the speaker talk slower or faster. Um, some of the other ones have slow, medium, fast. And, and the difference between slow and medium are too much. I, you can't tweak it. This one is awesome. You can also change voices and accents. I, I'll show you. I've got a, a British female that reads to me when I use it. Um, but it's a free add-on. So all you have to do is type in read and write Google Chrome while you're in Chrome and you see it pop up and you click that you want to add it to Chrome and it's added there in Chrome. So for instance, one of the things I try really hard to do is to put all the stuff I want them to read in Moodle on my page and try to avoid links. And the reason I try to do that is because there's no crap on the outside. It's just my text. I mean, you still have pictures and everything in there. But a lot of times if you send them to a website Where's the text? It's embedded with ads and pictures and everything. So I will take and harvest that text, and I'll still at the bottom of the text put, 
came from, whatever. I'll put a nice uh, reference to where it came from in there. But if my students click on this text and they go to this page, then they want to read it. And so I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to try to highlight it. What did I just do there? There, I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to highlight it all the way down here. I'll have to stop it here in a second. And, and I have this little tab up here that's the Read and Write Google Chrome tab. And when I when I click on that tab, it's, oh, there we go. I, I wasn't waiting long enough. I've got a little play button. The system bias is what starts the computer running when you turn it on. My volume too high now. The following are the steps that a typical boot sequence involves. Of course, this will vary by the manufacturer of your hardware, BIOS, etc. So I can pause it. It highlights it. This is why I like this one, especially for a low reader. It highlights the sentence as they go and highlights the word as they go. I have the ability over here to, I'd have to stop it, but on the settings um, with the options, you can see I have a slider bar. It's not just this speed or that speed. Uh, I, really slow reader, reader can slow it down considerably. Another reader who's got maybe a vision issue that can hear it fine and can process fine can have it normal or whatever. So for and book scans, that's how we can get that? That Okay, so, so this so is this. if it's in a website, okay? This doesn't work on the free version because this is the free version. There's a gold version you can pay for. This one don't, won't read a PDF. I have another one to read PDFs that will read for free. Okay, but so if I use my book scan, if I, I can't use this, this will do any website, including anything in Moodle, just fine. So if my book is on a website somewhere, then I'm you could okay. use it there, right. So like if we used um, ck12.org as our, as our textbook, it would be able to read that perfectly fine. Okay, and one of the things I wanna point out, when I say I'm gonna uh, harvest an article, let, let's say that I find um, something on, let me find a good, how to, if I, if I go and find an article on how to install a hard drive, a lot of times there's tons of stuff you can see embedded in there. Um, one of the things I use all the time to get that, I guess the word is out to what I want, is I use the Firefox one, and I don't know if you ever use this, but if I go to a Firefox page, I've got the little button here that t changes all the text, right? So if I go and click right there, then now all I have is the text and the pictures that apply to this article. All the junk is gone. So it's easy to take this and copy it into Moodle, and then it's all on Moodle. Now, I'll, it'll be able to read this fine if I was to be able to go there too, but I don't have a Chrome add-on that cleans it up as well as that just Firefox push the button type thing. So I have a tendency to move use uh, Firefox to move them over here and then I edit every year anyway because they don't get updated and hardware stuff gets updated. So that's I, I guess that's the first thing I wanted to, to, to point out is making the content accessible on Moodle, putting everything here. I don't have handouts, I, don't, I try to put everything I can there so my kids have access to it no matter what their reading level is, right? Whereas if I go and I send them someplace else, they may or may not be able to use a, good, a screen reader reasonably well on that. So that's the first thing I would consider making your, your content accessible. And that was, the, that was what I use uh, Read and Write for. The second one I use is called Speak It. It's not as good at all. And if, if I could just say there's one app that works the best, uh, I, I would, but Speak It is integrated and will work as long as I have Chrome open, and it'll work on anything that I open in Chrome, including a PDF, whereas Read and Write will not. So if I were to add Speak It, and I'll show you like this article right here um, that's in my Moodle page, they can highlight this. I, I actually, I'm not going to do as much because it, it doesn't have an easy stop button. So I'll just highlight that much. But if I right click now, since I've added it, it's right in there. Now there's no, there's no one for read and write in there, so it doesn't in integrate as well. But if I just say speak it, Bias. now. Basic input slash output system is an essential component in computers. What I don't like is, is it doesn't highlight the words, which is what read and write does great. It still reads to me, 
And those kids that have a problem reading, I still can get to everything, but now, you know. It doesn't it's, quite help them follow along. It doesn't help, right. I mean, it's still gonna help them read to me. And like I said, this one, you can see them up here in the top. This one still has options. If I go um, to, well, I guess I can't do it while it's highlighted, let's see. Uh, you can see the rate, I, I don't, well, I, I guess this one has more than the other one. So I got slowly, I got five different speeds on there. So I can't slow it down. My only choice in voices are male or female, which isn't terrible, but this one definitely wasn't as good as... Um, you like the limeys, huh? I like the limeys when they're reading. It makes me feel like I'm you know, Basic input listening to Harry Potter or something. I don't know. Essential component in computers. The big thing, though, is to me the highlighting the sentences and highlighting the words as they go. I think that's great for, for helping a reader along, too. And obviously, at our point, in high school, there may be no helping a reader along. They may have already plateaued at, plateaued at the point they can read at. When I get a computer student, and, and when I had ones in computer one that said reads at a third grade reading level, yeah. it's very likely that that's because that's all they're ever gonna read at. For a uh, because yeah. of some thing, some reason, right? So that's not as big a deal to, to highlight along, although I still think it helps comprehension and to see the word being highlighted at the same time. So that's why I like the other one better than this one. Uh, the other thing is, and, and it's the same thing we did when we scanned textbooks, um, in order to make it accessible, you have to OCR those files if you scan them. If you type them and save them as a PDF, they're fine, but OCR stands for Optical Character Recognition, and if you haven't done it before, it's this tinyurl.com NT OCR doc. It's a video. That one's only three minutes, or I'm sorry, two minutes long. And it's using Adobe Acrobat that we all have yeah. to turn the picture that we scan into text. Because I don't know if you remember when we go and use that scanner downstairs, it's really sending us pictures. Every it's a PDF file of pictures, okay. 15 pages of pictures. And if you go and scan those to yourself, there's no reading. It'll just say picture one, and then it'll go to page number two and say picture two, because it doesn't see words and only sees pictures. So you have to OCR them in order to make them accessible, right? So, and, and this is where I haven't gotten um, eaten to go yet because they go and scan stuff into an iPad for Luke, which allows him to manipulate them, right? He doesn't have the dexterity to, to open a book and turn pages because lefty doesn't work right. So all of his textbooks are on there and he can slide by them, and he, but he, there's no screen reader help because they're all pictures and they've never been OCR so that we can use a screen reader. So that is a one-step process that takes less than five minutes. And if you do it on your textbook, this is a video of actually me do it on uh, street law chapter or whatever. Um, it only takes a couple minutes and it's a one-time thing. So is that time you were on our Moodle? Our yeah, so our if, if, you, if we go to it, it's on our YouTube site. Um, and it's just on on how to do how to OCR documents. So somewhere in, you've already put that someplace else. OCR stands for optical. I just made this one because it's really short, so it's nowhere else other than linked on this right now. Okay. But we did it before in class a long time ago, and on that one on how to scan documents, it talks about this too. But this is just the short. Yeah, it was a long time ago. But this one's a short. Just how to open. I mean, basically, all you have to do once you are in there. So now, if um, you've got, uh, and well, I won't now, show the whole thing, but there's just a button that says AA this file. It OCRs it, you save it, and it's done. And it turns all the pictures into text. No, it also no. makes them way smaller. This this particular one was 16 gigabytes. After I OCR'd it, it was two. Because there's these huge, these are huge pictures, and then it takes away all the pictures and just makes that text, and then the kids can search through it because you can't search through those unless you OCR them. Because they're not words. Because they're not words. So you can do a control F all you want to and say, you know, G-force, and it's not gonna see, uh, Mr. Schreier, that wasn't in that article. Yes, it was, it was on page four. I told you to read about G-force. So, yes, that's an important step. And, and that's why I kind of had these, the shortcut on the bottom, so that if you wanted to go to any of those videos later, you'd be able to, by you know, if you go to there, you get to this, and then you can click on this. But I can send those links out with the video when I finish tonight. So that's that's a that's a step that um, 
I'm going to say most people are missing because many oh, schools don't, don't have Acrobat. Oh. We bought Acrobat just for that. Okay. Um, because when we were doing the uh, book scan thing, I found out that it was you know four times, actually it's eight times smaller when we OCR it, and you can search, and you can use screen readers and stuff. So that's the, I guess that's the next step in making our stuff accessible. It's not just making it a PDF, it's making it a, a PDF of words. So the last thing, the, really the last add-on to Chrome I wanted to talk about was this one. Um, I, I like this one the best of the dictionary add-ons because it works on PDF and it works on web pages. So that if kids have a term they don't understand, they can get the definition to it right then when they're reading the article instead of trying to find it to look it up. So, if, oops, I went too far. I thought I had a link to something on there. Let me go back to this one then. Um, so if I'm on this PDF and I don't know what the co word component means, I can just right click it and right down here is that dictionary lookup. It automatically goes to the dictionary definition of it. I can see how do I pronounce that word. Component. I'm not sure why I just did that. And then I can see the definition right there. So that kids have the ability to look up terms they don't understand. Many kids in our geographic, um, even the ones that can read well, may not have a, voca a wide enough vocabulary to even know what they just read, right? So having an online dictionary for them allows them to get to get more access to the content as well. And I, I mean, I know you probably are like me, you probably know countless students that um, maybe didn't get it in the college of their choice, then excelled really well in college. Um, because they, it's not that they weren't smart, they just weren't raised uh, in a socioeconomically advanced where words the vocabulary words. words were just foreign to them. So uh, I like this one, Dictionary, Thesaurus, and Reference, because it does all those things in one place. And it works on PDF files and Word web files and everything. It integrates right in. And then the last, I said that was the last one, I lied. This one's about being able to write on those same PDFs. And, and so, um, if, uh, and I, I'm going to go back to Luke on this, when he can't hold a pen well, and it will take him forever to write something that he could just type, hunt, and peck, peck 20 times faster, right? And I'm sure we all have kids that probably are have, have issues writing that might be able to work on them easier uh, if they could just use the keyboard that they already have in front of them. So Cami is an app that allows you to type on or write on anything. So this PDF, for instance, that's what it is. And if we were to go to that, um, when it opens up, because I have Cami installed, it should have opened up in Cami. I'm not kind of sure, sure why it didn't open in Cami. Unless it's open on the other side in Cami. Let me see. This is the Cami uh, button right here. And I have to go to options and see if I had it set to automatically load files of Cami. And I did not see it load that. Let me close some of these tabs. Because it should have just loaded that file in Cami. I'm going to go back to Moodle and open it up straight from Moodle and see if it may be because it's integrated in my presentation that it's not opening the way I think it would. That was chapter three. Here's the worksheet. Don't see the Kami thing. I should have a Kami bar over on the side, and I wonder if it's my. Well, this is a terrible. See, it should say that it's open in Kami right there. And every other time I've ever done this, I'm actually changed automatically load files to Kami. I don't know why it's not doing it. Well, I'll just explain it to you, and then I'll try to figure out later why I'm not getting the Kami bar on the outside of it. Kami lets me, uh, you know what, I'm just going to open a PDF and show you what it does. Kami should have opened up like this, and it allows me to, without any cost, type in text and be able to write. So if, uh, if you had this as a worksheet, which obviously this is not a worksheet, let's see if I can go someplace 
down here and I wanted to have them type right there, all they have to do is click anywhere and even though it's a PDF, they can type, type right on there. And when they're done, they can send it back to you by clicking on the little share button with all the annotations and everything they did on it. Okay. It also allows them to, if, if they had a um, the touchscreen computer like Luke has with his, with his iPad, it also allows, excuse me, it also allows them to write with it as well. So if you had a touch screen, you would be able to write right on there with the pen or with your finger. So you can do actual math problems or whatever right on a PDF as well. And this again is free. I'm not sure why it didn't open because it's always open straight up. It did it every single time I've shared it before this and it didn't do it this time for some reason. Yeah, I'll say, we'll say glitch. But that's one of the other things you can do. It's kind of the other way. I, I provided all these things as digital resources and then how do I get them back if I want them to be able to use worksheets or anything like that. So that now I can use a screen reader on this worksheet that the kid may not be able to read because if I give them a paper one, obviously I'm back to the same place. Yeah. That, that I can't use a screen reader and I can't use those tools, but now I can do this where they can use it to read it and they can go and, and type in the answers. Does anyone done. else use any of this? No. Here at Trail? Yeah. I know, I, I actually learned about Cami at the last conference I went to. There's one school that that's, they, they took out all the printers. They went one to one with Google Chrome. They bought the paid version of Cami and they said no one's allowed to pass out anything at all or collect anything because everyone's going to do every worksheet they ever do right on the Chromebook. And I mean, I, I will tell you that schools pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for copier contracts. And if we were up for a contract and we could save $200,000, how many Chromebooks does that buy? And we're a very small district, right? So. But is anybody here using it? I don't know that anybody else knows about Cami. That's what kind of one of the reasons that I'm doing all these is to help everybody else learn. Or that was like Speak It or any of those? Uh, that one I actually got from, okay, so yes, Speak It I got from um, Mrs. Sink. She's the one who said, can you make sure everybody can add Speak It to their Chrome? Because she was using that one. And Dan Studebaker is the one who was in the email chain who said, read and write's way better. You should try to read and write instead. So I tried them both and found out there were limitations to both. Um, that limitation on Speak It being only that I, it doesn't highlight, which I don't like. Uh, and the limitation on this one for the free version is that it won't read the PDFs for you. If you bought the gold version, then it would. That, at least that's what I, I read, that the gold version. So nobody inside of this wall. Nobody that I know over here, no. And, and that's the thing is that we have. If I want to walk and see something, I mean, that's people I would well, of, of this stuff, no. And that's one of the things that I kind of feel like we need to get out there is we're looking at UDL because we haven't had this conversation before, right? That, that it's not about, it's not, because the specialist teachers usually know. They're the ones who know about these things because I've talked about this stuff with middle school specialist teachers before and we've had, um, during the, the tech-in service, we talk about those things. But it's only the specialist teachers that come because they're worried about their kid who can't yeah. read not about every kid who might be behind in reading. I got those kids too. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. They're, they're, and, and so it, it's, not, it's not as good to say, okay, well, uh, you know, those three teachers over there in that little room know how to help kids with that when we have every kid in our, uh, the high school have access to Google Chrome and have access to this, but we're not doing it because we didn't think about it. So that was the point of doing this particular one when we started talking about UDL. Because I, yeah. I didn't know the term UDL until we had that thing last, was it on no, ETU no. in the spring? I don't, I mean. Right, that, that, was just. Yeah, no comment. On that one? Brief. Like, but it made, me, it made me go and watch the video on Teaching to the Edges that I had that little clip from. And it made me look into it more and it's like, okay, well that's really what we should strive for not just hey I can reach this kid if their parent brain comes in and has an IEP and and I know ahead of time it's if we try to do these things in our designing of our courses then we don't have to do as much differentiation because we've already differentiated the class kind of thing I think that's how I was doing it but I don't think I ever I mean, not ever I think when I thought of differentiation I was not doing it for a student. For a specific student, you were doing it for a class. I just kind of thought that's what it was. I guess I didn't. 
I thought I'm differentiating we're from all, you because we're all because you're a different learner yeah. than than there. I mean, I I was the guy Maybe who was groups. I thought of groups, perhaps. Well, okay, but my groups are smaller. <laughs> <laughs> groups are one. So I mean, but that's the way I. Here, that's really the way here. I thought of differentiation. I have to differentiate for that maybe that group of kids that are at this point in reading. But I didn't I didn't worry about it unless I got an IEP form that said or 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 identified them myself. But how often do we identify that they're a bad reader other than they've got a bad grade in my class and I don't, I'm not sure why. And but if we kind of the idea of UDL is we just design it. We all have these great kids in the first three weeks who are orally participating, giving all the right answers. You give the first test, it's like, what happened? Yeah. And that's when you discover they're not readers or they're not adequate readers. Right. And science is a foreign language. Right. And that and that's what that video was talking. And mine's the same way. I tell my kids you have to read things four times to understand a computer science text. And I'm sure it's the same way with science. The first time you read it, it's not even English. The second time you read it, it might be English words, but they weren't configured into an English sentence. The third time you read it, it's a sentence that you might understand. It takes four times, and that's my first one, it takes four times to read something that's technical to have any chance of comprehending it whatsoever. And, and in fact, it was a test question, last test. How many times in the school say you have to read something to understand what it said? And I'm sure science is the exact same way. If you have a screen reader, though, at least maybe, maybe cut out two of the readings because you actually, you know. And if, I'm a, if I have difficulty reading it the first time, I'm a slow reader, I sure as heck don't want to have to do it twice. Or three exactly, times. exactly. Or the, the, the kid or I'm struggled. embarrassed right. that it's taken me so long to read those three pages that everyone else seemingly whipped through. And, and if they've got the laptop and, they've, and it's online and they stick their headphone in their ear, and you say it's okay for them to read it using this if they want to do it along with their reading, then that kid who's a slow reader got to, you got to consume that material in the same amount of time. Maybe not as well as the kid next to him that's a you know, uh, fantastic reader, but way better than they would have if, if they would have gotten frustrated and given up. Because that's what I see with Luke sometimes is the frustration oh, up, sure. that, that he has because it's so difficult for him. You so continue reading, but you really well, yeah. Gave up. That's why it's like you have to read out loud. Dad, I don't want to read out loud. Yeah, but I don't know if you're reading if you're not saying it's it out loud. You're just flipping pages, you know, kind of thing. That happens on the other side of the wall a lot. So, but this way, at least, at least, and especially if we use uh, land school or whatever, you can walk around. If they're doing that, you know their potential of comprehension of the of the material. So. And that's what this was about. It's, I didn't want to, you know, obviously in 45 minutes, it's not going to explain all of UDL, because I don't know all of UDL. But the part of UDL that I can affect, I wanted to have a chance of, of making teachers more effective. So. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now, because we're, we're at time anyways. Anybody we're else? Fine. I, I see a blank screen. Okay. <laughs> okay.